Hello and welcome to episode 473 of the Money to the Masses podcast with your resident expert as always, Damien Fay, and me, Andy Leakes. Damien, welcome back. How are you doing this week? I'm good. It's good to be back as ever. And one thing I, I, I always forget to mention, actually, and I'm going to do it right at the start of the show. Don't forget that every week we produce a quiz on the show on our Instagram profile on a Monday morning. So that means what we do is we go and make a short quiz, multiple choice, five questions. Go and try it out on our story on Instagram and see how many you get right. And then you can tell us on there so you can test yourself. And we also put the transcript and the well, the bridge transcript and the questions in the post on the Money to the Masses website, which you can also have a look at at your own leisure. So yes, Andy, all good for this week. Again, as ever, there are three pieces on the podcast. I might as well just go straight into it and tell you what's going to be on the show this week. We're going to be doing three pieces as usual. I'm going to be doing an investment piece on the Efficient Frontier portfolio. So the whole theory behind that. A few years ago, I did a piece on this, but what I've done is I've actually updated the research and actually gone a little bit further, well, actually quite a bit further than I did last time. Then I'm going to go on to something called pension recycling. So if you're somebody who has started to take benefits, there'll be probably quite a few people who could even be in their 50s who may have taken some of their pension benefits relatively young. They may want to contribute to a pension again. I want to talk to you about that. There was something in the press that I saw this week that was actually wrong. So I want to give you some more information about the whole idea of pension recycling, how you can fall foul of some tax rules that could end up meaning that you get hit with a pretty hefty tax charge. And the final piece on the podcast, Andy, you're going to be looking into... Yeah, I'm going to be doing a short piece at the end of the podcast uh, talking about money mules. Now, it's not something we've covered on the podcast before, but I saw a piece in the press recently. And to be honest, it quite worried me because what's happening, fraudsters, people involved in financial crime are targeting young people and trying to encourage them to use their bank accounts to make some quick money in order to wash dirty money from the proceeds of crime. So it's quite scary stuff, but I'll do a quick piece at the end explaining what you need to look out for to make sure that you keep your young people safe. So Damien, then let's get on with your first piece then, the Efficient Frontier, an investing piece. Yeah, so the concept of the Efficient Frontier was introduced by Harry Markowitz back in 1952. And it's actually an important part of modern portfolio theory. And its fundamental principle helps investors build portfolios that offer like the highest possible returns for a given level of risk. And now the efficient frontier is derived from a, a set of optimal portfolios that provide that best return for the level of risk. And these portfolios lie along a curve that's known as the efficient frontier. Now, if you go back to podcast 389, I covered this in detail and did a really good piece, actually, a good summary of how it works. So to give you a visual representation of what I've just described, we're going to put a, an image in the notes of this podcast on the Main to Masses website. And if you're watching the YouTube version of this show, you will actually see an image on screen. Now, for those of you who aren't looking at any of those images, I want you to use your imagination. Imagine I asked you to build a lot of portfolios and look at the returns they achieved over a given period of time, let's say five years. Now, if you looked at the risk that was being taken by those portfolios, and if you use a risk measure, you could use something like volatility. It's not a, a definitive risk measure, but if we use volatility, it's often used when we're looking at efficient frontiers. That would give you an idea of the risk that you're taking. So if you think about a graph where you've got the x-axis, so that's a horizontal one, being risk. So the further along the x-axis you go, the more the portfolio is taken in terms of risk. And if you go up the y-axis, then that is the annualized rate of return. So if you had a whole load of portfolios and you plotted where they were on that chart, so their rate of return given their level of risk, then what will happen, you have lots of dots scattered across it. But what you could do is start to look at for a given level of risk that you're taking, what the best rate of return that was achieved. And that particular portfolio, you could zero in on it and then look at that asset mix. Now, in the past, when we've talked about it and when people generally talk about the efficient frontier, they look at bonds and equity. So a portfolio is just made out of those two assets. Now, 
if you go and look at the chart that we're going to have included on the video and on the website you will see there's a chart that has a curved line on it now that thing is called the mark of its bullet now the idea of that is if you plot the various different portfolios the optimum portfolios you'll get this line so if you think about it the more risk you start to take you would think the better your analyzed rate of return and as you may know from experience the more risk you take doesn't automatically equate to a better rate of return and so somebody for example who may be in 100 percent bonds in their portfolio if they actually start to take a little bit more equity exposure the risks in their portfolio could actually start to fall because they're starting to diversify and their annual rate of return will start to increase now if you look at that image that i talked about it starts to give you a a kind of a bullet shape so your rate of return is going up, but your actual risk is starting to drop. Then you get to a point where the more equity exposure that you take, then your annual rate of return starts to creep up. But it gets to a point where there's a law of diminishing returns. And that is where you start to look at this efficient frontier. So you can draw a line. So everything below that on the chart are portfolios that don't actually give you much more return for the risk that you're taking. So you can look for a given level of risk, what the optimal portfolio in terms of bond and equity exposure is to give you the maximum annualized rate of return of course that is looking at history now what i did is for 80 20 investor members this week is go back and decide to look at the efficient frontier but not just with equities and bonds i threw a whole load of assets into the mix to see if i could work out what would be an efficient portfolio the most efficient portfolio over five years and 10 years now of course it does depend on the level of risk that you're taking so what i did was go and find two of the multi-asset unit trust sectors out there now there is one that has a share exposure typically between 20 percent and 60 percent of the funds assets so all of the funds within there fall within that remit and there's a slightly more balanced bordering on adventurous sector that has the 40% to 85% equity exposure. So I looked at what was the volatility of the average fund within each of those sectors over five and 10 years. And that gave me a risk measure. So then I looked at various different portfolios using the whole efficient frontier analysis, which actually you can really only do with a computer program of some kind that can do the huge numbers of calculations to come up with the optimum portfolios. So what I did was take the cautious risk level and the more balanced risk level and thought, well, can we work out that portfolio from all the assets that I've chosen to put in there potentially? Can I work out the most efficient portfolio? And what was the annualized rate of return of that particular portfolio over five and 10 years? So for the full research, you can obviously go and take out a free trial of 8020 Investor. So what I'm going to do for the podcast is tell you what was the most efficient portfolio, giving you the optimum rate of return for what would probably be considered a, an average level of risk. And so the assets I'm going to run through that I included potentially in that portfolio were Asian equities. They were Chinese equities, commodities, uh, European equities, global bonds, gold. Uh, global emerging markets, Indian equities, Japanese equities, Latin American equities, North American equities, property, cash, and obviously we had sterling corporate bonds, UK equities, and UK gilt. And by performing the analysis, not every asset does ultimately appear in the final portfolio because it looks at all the different combinations and potential allocations to each of those asset classes. And I also gave bands. So, for example, I didn't allow the portfolio to have more than 10% gold exposure. Now, if you've been a long-term 80-20 investor member or podcast listener, you know that beyond that kind of level, gold starts to become a, an asset that starts to increase the level of volatility within your portfolio. So I wanted to keep that in a, a sensible range. So there were some ranges I put in there, but ultimately what matters for the podcast was what was the optimum portfolio that came out for a 10-year period what was the annual rate of return for that particular portfolio? Because as I've already mentioned, 
the level of volatility and we'll call that risk for the purposes of the podcast today. That was matching the typical level of risk taken by a professional fund manager that operates within that 40 to 85% equity range that is in that particular sector that I mentioned earlier. Now, the optimum portfolio had an 11% exposure to Asian equities. It had a 20% exposure to European equities, a 10% exposure to gold, 5% allocation to Indian equities, 15% exposure to Japanese equities and a 20% exposure to North American equities, 4% in cash and 15% in UK equities. So taking it all in the round, that optimum portfolio had an 86% equity exposure, which was obviously right at the top end when you compare it to the sector which had a range of funds or hundreds of funds that range from 40 to 85 percent equity exposure but that's because it was actually optimizing that risk now i did have to assume for the sectors that i've mentioned that the portfolio achieved the average rate of return for that particular sector so asian equities it would be the average return for an asian equity fund within that that ensures that the portfolio return i'm about to tell you is typical it's not exaggerate i've not picked all the best funds within that particular sector for example now the benchmark that i use like i said that particular sector the 40 to 85 percent equity exposure the mixed multi-asset funds that average fund from that sector produced an annualized rate of return over 10 years of 4.71 percent the portfolio i've just described to you produced an annualized rate of return of 7.87 percent so it's a huge difference but it took the same level of risk as the average or typical fund from that mixed investments 40 to 85 percent shares sector that i've mentioned so there you go i've applied the efficient frontier to a range of assets it's a huge amount of calculations to give you what would be the optimum portfolio over the last 10 years now the one thing you will notice that i've said over the last 10 years because it does obviously take into account the returns that various assets achieved in the last 10 years so depending on what's happened in the recent history the most efficient portfolio can change so for 80 20 investor members i did carry out the same analysis but just on the last five years and the portfolio is quite different actually so if you want to see that like i say you can go and take a free trial there is a cautious portfolio for the 10 year and for the five year time frames as well as well as that balanced portfolio for the five-year period. So there you go, Andy. That's the efficient frontier analysis. Now, those of you who listen closely will notice there wasn't actually any bond exposure in that particular portfolio I read out. And that is obviously reflective of what's happened in recent years. We've seen bonds do particularly badly, but the gold and cash element obviously knocked bonds out. But if you go and look at the cautious portfolio that obviously 80, 20 investor members do get access to the cautious version does have bond exposure in it which i suppose you would probably expect to a certain degree but there is still very limited bond exposure and that's because as i mentioned at the start of this piece the high bond exposure didn't actually reduce your risk and that's because of what we've seen in the last few years in bond markets okay so let's move on to the next piece of the podcast then damien i'm going to be talking about pension recycling something came up in the news recently and it piqued your interest so that's right i was reading the national press as i do particularly the money pages and there was a question in there from a reader who was asking could they use the tax-free cash that they'd previously taken from their pension and put it into a new pension and get tax relief on that contribution and also they could potentially take some more tax-free cash from that contribution but what they're really after is that tax relief and The answer they got from the newspaper expert was technically incorrect. So what I want to do is highlight what is called pension recycling, explain what it is, but also point out to people that there is a potential to fall foul of it, even if you didn't realise you were doing it. So pension recycling is where an individual reinvests their tax-free cash or pension income back into a pension scheme. Now, if you do that, then that can obviously create additional tax relief and a fresh entitlement to tax-free cash and pension benefits. Now, HMRC 
limits the amount of additional tax relief that is available when tax-free cash or certain pension income is recycled. And the reason they do that is not because they're trying to be party poopers and don't want people to try and boost their pension just ahead of retirement, because this is a time when people are likely to do this. They may have taken some benefits, but want to just give their pension pot a bit of a boost as they start to get that bit older. What they're trying to do is to stop people playing the system and keep recycling pension tax free cash or income to get that tax relief and boost their pension pot. Now, HMRC have rules that apply if the pension recycling was pre-planned because they are opposed to people using tax free cash to substantially increase that pension funding, as I've mentioned. And the intent to make significantly greater contribution to a pension scheme obviously may seem to be something that is subjective, but HMRC actually have rules around this to test against. And therefore, that is how people can inadvertently not realise they've fallen foul of these pension recycling rules. Now, if you fall foul of the rules, then you can face substantial tax penalties, which I'll come on to later on. But what HMRC do is they review your contributions in the tax year that the tax-free cash is taken and the two years either side of that so that can take you up to five years which they will look at and then what they do is if the tax-free cash that was taken in the last 12 months exceeds 7,500 and you get pension payments that are increased by at least 30 percent of the tax-free cash taken and the contributions exceed 30 percent of the expected pension payments then if you fall foul of those measures then you'll be classed as pre-planning the pension recycling. And therefore, there are potential tax penalties. Now, you might think those rules seem slightly strange in the way that they are made, but they are such as to try and stop people who may, for example, decide that they are going to take their tax-free cash and therefore try and recycle it into a pension. But what they might do, for example, is have large amounts of savings that they then decide to utilise that and assuming that they have the relevant earnings to be able to make the pension contribution, make a pension contribution and then withdraw their tax-free cash later and top their savings back up. So the rules enable HMRC to see through all of that and say, do they fall foul of the the rules that I've just mentioned? If they do, then they deem that to be pre-planned. Now, in terms of penalties, if you are obviously deemed to have fallen foul of the rules set out by HMRC, then you could, in theory, have a charge of 70% of the tax-free cash that you've taken. So that is a sizable penalty. So do make sure that you seek advice. Now, one thing that the newspaper got wrong that I mentioned earlier, which is the thing I really particularly want to point out, is that if you are drawing benefits from a pension, I'm not talking about just tax-free cash. If you actually take in an income of some kind, then you will trigger the money purchase annual allowance, which actually limits the amount you can pay into a pension and get tax relief in a given tax year. So rather than the limit being £60,000 as it is now, or your taxable earnings, whichever is lower, then your annual allowance actually falls to £10,000. So in the newspaper article, the person was actually or they'd already triggered their money purchase annual allowance. They didn't mention that, and they were saying they could actually pay more than £15,000 and get the tax relief. Well, that's not actually true. So you have to bear that in mind. So there's moving parts in all of this. If you've taken benefits, you're getting some kind of income from your pension, for example, then your money purchase annual allowance will have kicked in, and so that will reduce it to £10,000. And all of that is also there to try and limit people who are ineffectively gaming the system by keep making further pension contributions. So one thing I've got to point out is that there are some caveats, so some things that don't count as pension recycling. So if you were to join a new employer's pension scheme, so you took a new job and you're auto-enrolled, for example, and that actually caused your pension contributions to increase, then that is something that they won't penalise you for. And equally, if you have a windfall, so inheritance or a lottery, then they will consider that as well when they're looking at what happens in terms of your contributions to a pension and obviously 
um, recycling. So think about that, that if you've taken some tax-free cash, for example, and you actually gain some more money, they wouldn't deem it necessarily that it was pre-planned. So you've got to think there is a, a little bit of realism in there. And also another one is if you keep the contribution levels the same, so let's say the percentage level the same, and your company profits increase, so therefore your contributions increase because they are based on a percentage of profits, then they do take that into account as well. So pension recycling is something that people don't talk about. In fact, we've never talked about it on the podcast, but it's worth people understanding what it is, that it exists. And if they are thinking about potentially paying money into a pension once they've taken some kind of benefit, then do in your mind have that flag go off to say oh i need to be mindful i'm not breaking any rules around pension recycling inadvertently and go and research those rules but also do make sure you go and seek advice because this is one of the reasons why i always say when it comes to taking advice at the point that you take benefits from pensions in particular then that is a time where i think it is definitely worth seeking advice and for some people that may just be down to the point of not pension recycling, but triggering that triggering that money purchase annual allowance that they might not actually realise they're about to do that. And they had planned to continue to contribute into their pensions going forward. Or before we move on, one other uh, caveat I've just thought of is that the pension recycling rules don't actually apply if you use your tax-free cash to fund, let's say, your spouse's pension. It's just if the money goes into a pension that's in your own name okay so let's move on to the final piece of the podcast then and i just wanted to bring to the podcast something i saw in the press and i've seen on tv recently and it's talking about the dangers of getting involved with financial crime and particularly becoming a money mule now it might seem simple to you and i damien that you know we wouldn't get caught up in this but this was particularly sort of focusing on young people inexperienced perhaps young teens maybe people going to university, students, people who aren't used to dealing with money, dealing with bank accounts, and maybe getting offers of easy money. So let me just explain quickly what a money mule actually technically is. So the definition here is a money mule is someone who transfers or moves illegal acquired money on behalf of someone else, often in exchange for a small commission. Now what happens is fraudsters will use these money mules to wash dirty cash, dirty money that are often the proceeds of financial crime. And it serves as a sort of middle step to move these funds in and out of these lots of different accounts so that it makes it very difficult for the authorities to trace the money back to the original crime. Now, it's worth making the point that becoming a money mule is illegal and can lead to a pretty serious and severe consequences, such as your bank account being closed, difficulty in obtaining financial services in the future. For example, you think like students are going into university to get a good career and everything else. Well, they get caught up in this and this could pretty much be the end of that career that they're hoping and aspiring for. It'll make it difficult for people to have a bank account, like I've said before. Also getting mortgages and things like that, it can really cause problems. And even in the worst instances, a prison sentence as well. So I thought I'll just briefly explain exactly how this comes about, what is happening, just so people on the podcast could be made aware of it. Because even if you don't think you could easily become embroiled in this, I guarantee that we all know someone that is just starting out in life that might just see something on social media and might be susceptible to this sort of thing. So the target audience, as I've already said, are young people, particularly students, anyone sort of aged 18 to 30, and they're often targeted because they're less aware of financial fraud. Perhaps they're a bit more free and easy with their decisions because they're young and they think they, <laughs> they think they know best in some cases. I know my children certainly do. So what you'll often find is these things crop up on social media. There'll be maybe some sort of fake job ad or investment opportunity or a get rich quick scheme on Instagram, Snapchat, Facebook. Yeah. And, and, that, and I mean, Andy, I can fully appreciate it's, it's, it's easy for people to sit there and think how does it happen but you can also put yourself in a young person's point of view that may be going to university that may be struggling to find a job or have very little income or money and they see something online that basically says look i'm just going to put money into your account and 
temporarily for whatever reason and you keep a percentage and they feel like they're making money for nothing and ignorance isn't an excuse but as you've mentioned they think they're just making money for nothing but actually they're doing something that's illegal yeah i mean it is massively illegal and as i said it can lead to uh, prison sentence as well so i thought i'd just mention a few of these warning signs how to identify that you might be being targeted as a potential money mule so if something seems too good to be true often it is look out for things on these job descriptions it, things that are vague you know offers that like detail especially those that don't specify what type of work it is that you'll be needing to do requests to use your bank account or any request talking about your bank account very early in the conversation should be a red flag if you're being pressurized if there's urgency and pressure then that is often a case that this might not be what it deems to be uh, request for personal information again from the get-go any anywhere where you're being asked for your bank details national insurance number copies of your id i would generally be wary of anything like that and the next sort of thing i wanted to just quickly say is in terms of what you should do if you feel you've been targeted so again if we know anyone pass on this advice the first thing you need to say to them is to stop all communication immediately stop with the fraudster don't share any further information First and foremost, contact your bank. And if you've already shared some details, your bank details, for example, contact the bank, explain the situation, uh, report the fraud to people like Action Fraud and uh, seek advice from perhaps um, a trusted adult, a teacher, someone at the school or university and just talk to them and explain what's happened. Now, not to sort of put too much sort of fear out there. The thing that I was watching on TV did explain that a person did exactly that they got a fair way down the line in, in in engaging with someone and then the red flag came up and they realized that this didn't seem right and they did let their parents know their parents got in touch with the authorities and unfortunately what happened then is that led to those people being targeted by these uh, criminal gangs with pictures of their house and threats and damage to their property and they actually had to move out of the house and go into a uh, in, into protection while they were sort of getting through this so that's just a kind of a word of warning this isn't just oh innocent doing something on your phone it will be all right you're dealing with se severe criminals organized crime just don't get involved from the uh, fr fr from the get-go that's the advice yeah and on that i mean i see lots of stuff on social media and um, it does drive me mad because we put posts out, videos out, and often there are ridiculous comments that start to appear, spam comments, which link through to people saying they've got opportunities and all that. And of course, we're all over that, trying to delete those as quickly as they appear. But you can see how easily it is if somebody will believe something they read on social media. And we have to not judge people who are younger now, because one of the things I've said to people before, when different generations see things differently, so people years ago would have probably said, oh, I heard it on the radio as if that was a form of validation, then maybe people would say, oh, I read it in the newspaper, then watched it on TV, that's probably our generation, Andy, that oh, if it's on TV, it must be valid. But the reality is that as time's gone on, people can pay to be in those types of medium. And of course, for the generation now, it's social media. They use that more than anything else and don't really watch as much TV, especially my children. So therefore, they, they think, well, I've seen it on TikTok, I've seen it on Instagram, that's their validation method we've all had our own validation methods over the years theirs unfortunately is they think because they see it on there that somehow validates that it is something that other people are doing they don't necessarily have the wealth of experience to see it as for what it is so they shouldn't be ashamed they shouldn't be embarrassed but it is worth pointing out to people that um, it is too good to be true because young people always want to try and earn a bit of money however they can jobs whatever they are and actually the opportunities aren't there for people to who are teenagers for example who are young teenagers to earn a bit of money outside of the home so do bear that in mind um i think that's a great piece andy um i think we're done for this week on the podcast aren't we yeah we are so that's it so if you want to get in touch with us you can do so in the usual ways it's damien at money to the masses.com if you want to contact me you can it's andy at money to the masses.com please do check out this podcast if you're not already watching it on youtube and you listen to our audio version head over to YouTube, subscribe to us while you're there. The Money to the Mass is really easy to find, but do watch and also comment on the video itself so that we can reply to that. Damien, you and I, we both see those and we are involved in personally responding 
to any questions that come through. If you've got any ideas for future shows, that's a great place to share that as well. Don't forget, you can also check the Money to the Masses community group on facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash money to the masses. That's another place you can go to talk about the show itself if you want to, but also share um, ideas for the future podcasts and any questions you have about money is a really, really good community on there. And Damien, our other socials as well. We're very active on Instagram and TikTok as well. And of course, I know I've mentioned it a number of times in recent weeks, but don't forget that we will be asking you in the Facebook group to help us test a new exciting project. In fact, it's the most exciting thing we've ever done at Money to the Masses, and we're absolutely buzzing about it. So do join the Facebook group if you haven't done so already, because you could be part of that group potentially to help us test our new project. So something very exciting there. So Andy, all that's left is for us to say until next time. Until next time. <laughs>